Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 25th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said to the disciples, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, and he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, and, or naked and gave you clothing? And was it, when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will say to them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seated. Sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, grace and peace to you from the God of our Lord Jesus Christ. As people who live in a democracy, as descendants of people who revolted against the tyranny of monarchy and celebrated that event annually, Jesus' parable today can be a little bit difficult for us to understand or even embrace. Jesus' parable begins with the words, When the Son of Man comes, in glory, and all the angels with him. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory. That glory is not simply a bright light show that puts our 4th of July fireworks to shame. More accurately, that glory points to Jesus being the one who reigns over creation. Glory points to reigning. Not reigning, but you know, reigning. <laughs> And Jesus is the one who reigns as Christ the King. Thus, to be part of the church means that we do not live by democratic rule, ruled by the people. To be a disciple means that we acknowledge that we are ruled by God in Jesus, present in spirit. The church is not democratic, in other words, but pneumocratic, spirit Left. That said, it is important to understand how Jesus got to sit on that throne. Jesus gets to because he is fully God, the Word of God made flesh, and because he is fully human, born of Mary, and died on the cross in service to humanity. Jesus died on the cross to make a way through human suffering through dehumanization and nothingness, in order to renew our way of being human, made in the image of God. In other words, to be human is to serve others, especially the least. This notion of serving the least was quite revolutionary. In fact, it was completely revolutionary for Jesus' day. Because the whole idea of serving the least made absolutely no sense whatsoever. You sought to serve the greatest, 
Because then you could hope to gain status, protection, security, and maybe even a little prestige if you were faithful enough. In other words, service was part of the rat race. Thus Jesus' way of looking at service upended the whole system. The first shall be made last, and the last, the least, shall be made first. <coughs> As such, this understanding of service was, at the very least, meant to help disciples to be set free from the fear of being the least. Service sets us free for the life of the reign of God that upholds not self-aggrandizement, can say that word once, oh, that'd be a miracle. But self-denial, not pride, but humility. Service sets us free to say no to the rat race, to world the games of promotion, hierarchy, prestige, and human privilege. Service is meant to transform us in our understanding and living out of what it means to be truly human. When seen in this light, we can see why Jesus praised the sheep, those who served the least. Truly, I tell you, just as you did it to the least of me, or least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. By serving the least, the sheep rehumanized them and delivered them from nothingness. Likewise, the Son of Man scorned those who did not serve the least, these goats pursued power and privilege, and because they didn't see the Son of Man in the least, they didn't see the least and did nothing. What was in it for them, after all? And in the process, they perpetuated dehumanization and nothingness, which the Son of Man came to end. We also must take care to understand that service can still be abuse. <coughs> service that allows you to stay in control is not necessarily service. The whole notion of the white man's burden saving those savages from their barbarism and backward culture was not and is not service. That is hubris and perpetuation of dehumanization. Serving because it makes you feel good is not service, that is, self-service. Or if you serve, but fear that you are being used, then it is probably not service either. You see, the spiritual discipline of service is not so much about serving as it is about being a servant. Being a servant is being open to responding when called upon. You are not in charge. But in order to do that, you have to be willing to practice another spiritual discipline, the one of submission. Sadly, the discipline of submission is probably the most abus abused discipline there is. Rather than lift people up and set them free, it has been used to subjugate and dehumanize people for millennia. The purpose of the discipline of submission is to teach us not to make everything about me. Submission is meant to set us free from the burden of always needing to stubbornly get your own way, thereby making others your slaves and dehumanizing them, so that you are instead free to live out Thy will be done. Counterintuitively, submission is meant to free us from bondage and manipulation so that we are free to love our neighbors, to subversively undo hierarchy, thereby creating equality and equity for all. In Jesus' day and before, instructions were only given to slaveholding men on how to treat their slaves and wives, ethically. Instructions were never given to slaves, wives, the poor, or the least. When Jesus told people, in other words, to go the extra mile, when a soldier compelled them to carry their, those soldiers' 100-pound packs, 
Jesus was instructing people to practice submission. To not carry the pack for one mile as the law compelled them to do against their will, but to go two miles or more by choice. This was the way back to one's freedom and to love one's neighbor at the same time. When Paul, for example, told slaves to submit to their masters and wives to their husbands, this was intended to empower people in their dehumanizing positions of leastness. Paul was saying, don't do it because you were told or ordered to do something. Do so because you have chosen to serve as a servant out of love. Love is your power that others can't take away from you because it comes from God first. Then, after having said that, Paul then tells, Paul told the slaveholding men to love their slaves and their wives. In effect, Paul told those in positions of power to submit to their slaves and wives. If you are confused on how this could possibly work, consider Paul's letter to Philemon. And then Paul writes to his friend and fellow Christian Philemon, whose slave Onesimus, had run away to Paul. Onesimus served Paul as a servant faithfully for several years. When Paul realized that Onesimus and Philemon needed to be reconciled back to one another. So Paul sends Onesimus back, telling him to submit to his master. And in the letter, Paul begs Philemon to not only accept him back as a slave, but as a brother in Christ. That brother in Christ was important because if Philemon were to take his faith, the Christian way of life, seriously, that would ultimately require Philemon to release Onesimus as a slave. Thus, the least, the lowest, would subversively be lifted up, and the greatest, those of the highest places, would be brought down. The high places would be made level creating equality and equity among humanity, who live as truly human, people fit to live in the reign of God. In Jesus' parable today, we are called to live out the spiritual disciplines of service and submission to one another and to Jesus. Even in the face of our historic loyalty to democracy and anti-monarchical tendencies. As disciples of Jesus, we are called to bend the knee and submit ourselves, our heart, mind, body, and strength, our whole lives, to Christ the King. This may grate on our sensibilities, but let us not forget that Jesus first practiced submission and service, not only before God, but before all of humanity including you and me, when he carried the cross and died to set us free from sin, death, and evil, from dehumanization and nothingness. It is counterintuitive, counterintuitive for us to think that submission to God equals freedom and that failure to submit results in dehumanization and nothingness. But in rising from the dead, Jesus shows us the truth of the matter. So, let us practice what it means to be truly human, made in the image of God, for that is what we are being prepared for, the reign of God prepared from for the foundation of the world. Amen. Amen. Amen.